Well, welcome to Grace, everyone, and welcome back to our uh, our Thursday night Q&A Zoom study. Uh, it's been kind of interesting over the past couple of weeks or past few weeks, really, and we're going to pick it up and continue on uh, on that same vein in tonight's lesson. But uh, I'd like for us to take a few minutes to step back, uh, so to speak, and ponder some of the things we've learned from Scripture thus far when we take God at his word literally, or as some would say at face value. So to begin with, uh, we learned that the definite article the, T-H-E, when placed in front of a noun or pronoun, is a word of specificity. In other words, the definite article the is pointing to a particular person, place, or thing, not to many, but to one, a particular one. This lets us know that when the Apostle Paul speaks of the church of God, he has only one church, one called out assembly or out calling of God in mind. Uh, that definite article, the, points to one again, a particular one. So uh, since Paul said he persecuted the church of God, pointing us back to the Jewish believers prior to his own conversion, he was letting us know that God considered the Jewish outcalling prior to Paul to be members of his household of faith and therefore a part of the church of God. Uh, they were God's outcalling, God's assembly of believers, the word translated church, of course, simply meaning an assembly and outcalling. God considered all believers, including the Jewish believers prior to Paul, members of his household of faith because of their faith and what he had revealed to them. So every believer of every dispensation is included in the church of God. Paul not only persecuted those previous Jewish believers uh, prior to his conversion, he called those believers the church of God, just as he called those who believed his gospel the church of God. So God had made Paul's converts part of the very same church, not a different church. So the concept of God having two separate and distinct churches, a kingdom church and a body of Christ church, was a theory advanced in the early 1800s, but it was never a reality. Um, I regret I taught that very uh, line of thinking uh, for several years. But now consider the believers of today. Must every member of the church of God today serve in the same capacity as every other member? Well, obviously not. We, we know better than that because the Apostle Paul tells us differently. In fact, he taught differently in Corinth. They didn't all serve in the same uh, position. So don't make the mistake of thinking that serving the Lord in different capacities means that you have to have two different churches, as some are suggesting. What else did we learn in our studies um, to date? Well, we learned that our risen ascended Lord of glory is going to come back again for all who belong to him. He's not going to make a couple return trips or even a secret return trip as taught by two different church proponents, but he's only going to make one future return trip to the earth. And there'll be nothing secret about that second coming of Christ. The words coming and appearing in regard to the return of Christ are spoken of in more than one Bible passage and revealed by Christ himself. And they're always in the singular, never in the plural, as the majority text manuscripts speak of the coming and the appearing of Christ. Paul and other writers of scripture reveal that very thing. Uh, so we learned that in connection with God's one church, the church of God that comprises all the believers of all the ages, we learned that God has appointed different stewards or different house managers to carry out his instructions for that household of faith down through the course of time. The word dispensation simply means steward or the overseeing house manager who has been appointed to that position at the direction of the owner of the household who has appointed him to that position. So Paul is today's steward, a dispensation, a stewardship was appointed to Paul. So a different economy is in place as Paul uh, was given the charge to make all men see how God is working with everyone today, according to his uh, matchless grace. Well, the steward God has appointed over his household of faith, the church of God, shifted from Peter to Paul. When God ceased dealing with Israel on a national basis and began dealing with all people alike on an individual basis. Uh, so we know that there was no transition period before the changing of stewardships. But when God decided it was time to, to appoint a new steward, he appointed that new steward. Something else for you to ponder, to ponder is that there will only be one additional house manager present on earth over God's household of faith in time future. And that house manager will be the son of God himself, as believers prior to Paul and including Paul were anxiously awaiting his return. So God placed um, Paul in charge of setting forth the household rules in what Paul calls these last days until the return of Jesus Christ. 
God has placed all things under Christ's feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, the church of God. Paul tells us that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 23. So let's quickly review that passage if I can uh, get my slides to advance. Okay, beginning with 18 on Ephesians chapter 1. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his, God the Father's, calling, and what the riches of the glory of the Father's inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of God the Father's power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he, God the Father again, wrought in Christ, when he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And the word world there, as we're going to see, is the word uh, aeon or aeon, which means age, not only in this age, but in the age to come. Verse 22, and God hath put all things under Christ's feet and gave him, Christ the Lord, to be the head over all things to the church, singular which is his body, which is Christ's body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So God the Father has given all power and authority to God the Son over God's household of faith. And it was Christ over everything, actually. And it was Christ, the visible manifestation of the invisible Father, the Son of God himself, who appointed the Apostle Paul to be the earthly house manager over God's household of faith in order that Paul might make known to all men what God wanted all men to know prior to Christ's return to the earth. So the Bible describes Christ's future return to the earth as his second coming, not his third coming, not even a secret coming, but his second coming, according to the writer of the letter to the Hebrews, who, although not Paul himself, was an obvious fellow worker with Paul, and he knew Paul's message quite well. In fact, his epistle or his letter is full of Pauline doctrine. Notice his statement in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, written according to Bishop Unger, the famous Bible chronologist, at the close of the Apostle Paul's ministry, somewhere around 64 AD. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto him that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Paul was looking for him. Peter was looking for him. Everyone that talked about his second coming was looking for him to come back. In fact, he's coming back for that purpose. The writer of this letter was human. However, the author of this epistle to the Hebrews, God, the Holy Spirit, who obviously would have known if there was to be a secret coming prior to the coming he was referencing in this statement, in which case he would have used the expression the third time rather than the second time. And by the way, for those who might be interested, the expression the second time appears 29 times in the pages of Scripture. And the word translated second is the Greek word uh, deuteros, from which we get our English terms duo or dual, which never means three, never means four or five or more. It always means two. So reason it through. If Paul was to make all men see the revelation of the mystery, which the writer of Hebrews penning this letter around AD 64 toward the close of Paul's ministry would certainly have known, and including solid Pauline doctrine, as I said earlier, obviously the writer and certainly the Holy Spirit author would have used the word meaning three had God intended there to be a third so-called secret coming of Christ. Uh, can't be very secret, as we'll see coming up a little later on. Little wonder. All of the mentions of Christ's future return begin with the definite article, the, the coming, the appearing of our Lord and Savior. Never do we see the comings, the appearings, or one of the comings, or one of the appearings. Uh, we don't even see the secret coming. We see the coming and the appearing. And Paul and Peter use the very same terms, both terms, coming and appearing. And they used them in the very same manner. So according to scripture, Christ is coming back to earth a second time. And when he returns the second time, he's going to bring all those who will have died in faith prior to his return back with him as he catches all believers in the air to be with him. His entire household of faith throughout the ages will be leaving this planet at a time in the future. Uh, Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. 
And so the bodies of those deceased saints are going to be resurrected and then all living believers will be caught up together with them in the air prior to Christ pouring out his purging and avenging wrath on all the God and Christ deniers who will be opposing not only God and Christ, but will also be opposing those who belong to Christ. So keep in mind that Christ returned the second time to rescue his saints from the Antichrist and the unbelievers opposition was not a part of the mystery. Christ spoke of it. Peter spoke of it. James mentioned it. The author of the letter to the Hebrews uh, wrote about it. And we certainly see it uh, from, from Paul's writings. And John obviously had a lot to say about it in the book of the Revelation or the revealing of Christ Jesus. So, but, but what about the when part? What about the when aspect of Christ's second coming? W-H-E-N. Of all the mentions of Christ's second coming, Jesus Christ himself gave the most detailed information regarding the timing of his return to rescue his church, the elect, prior to his destroying those who would be standing in opposition to him, as well as in standing in opposition and persecuting the saints. That information sits in Matthew chapter 24, verses 3 through 32, along with Mark chapter 13, verses 3 through 37, otherwise known as Christ's Olivet Discourse. So taken together with Daniel's prophecy, Paul's writing, and the book of the Revelation, that gives us a broad picture of Christ's second coming. Some of you may be familiar with Christ's teaching about the last days. Um, and as you'll recall, hopefully, <laughs> Christ was on the Mount of Olives teaching his disciples when they asked this all-important question. You see, they had known that Christ had said he would return, he would come again. But what had they not known? Well, they hadn't known when. So they decided to ask him that very thing. Here it is in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. And as he sat, Christ sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign, the indicator of thy coming? In other words, how will we really know that it's you that's coming and that your coming signals the end of the age, the end of the world, it says there. But the world, again, the word world, again, is a translation of the Greek, aion, literally meaning age. Now, when you see age, don't think everything is one single age because there can be ages without end, uh, which is why we see uh, that uh, we see God being spoken of as eternal. What shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? The end of what age, we might ask next? Well, the end of the last days, uh, the last times the Bible speaks of. In other words, the last days in connection with the last day, uh, which would be the end of the age. I'm sure you recall the Apostle Paul's words in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, where the Apostle wrote, This know also, that, catch it here, in the last days, perilous meaning difficult dangerous times uh, shall come well we see that don't we even now uh, and as far as this country is concerned we see it more than we've ever seen it in our, our past here james told his listeners you have heaped treasure together for the last days uh, that treasure being negative treasure james was telling them uh, so james knew about the judgment to take place on the last day you see the judgment seat of christ is to take place at christ's second coming according to paul Peter spoke of the very same last days in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, where Peter wrote, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Boy, it sounds like a lot like Paul in 2 Timothy 3, chapter 1, doesn't it? And that's because these three men were not talking about different last days. They were talking about the last days. You see the definite article there. They were talking about the last days leading up to the last day and Christ's second coming, first and foremost to rescue his saints out of that time, to be immediately followed by the pouring out of his wrath on the Antichrist and his unbelieving minions, who will be persecuting the saints, his saints at that time. But going back to Matthew chapter 24, and Christ's Olivet Discourse, where he was revealing in an, in an overview of sorts, he's giving kind of a, a, a short as it is, an overview of sorts, uh, the, of the sequence of events as the last days culminate in the last day, during which his return, his rescue of his saints, and his judgment on the unrighteous will all occur on that very same day. Remember, his disciples were asking him the when question and what would be the sign, the signal that was actually his coming rather than something else. Now, think about that for just a moment. Halfway through, 
the seven-year tribulation period, Satan, along with his rebellious angelic force, is cast out of the stellar realm by way of his battle, by way of their battle with Michael and God's elect angelic fighting force. Satan knows his time is short, the Bible tells us, and he's wroth. He's very angry. And he indwells the man of sin, the Antichrist, who moves into the temple halfway through the tribulation period and proclaims that he is the true Christ, during which he will be performing all those lying signs and wonders in an attempt to actually convince people that he is indeed the true Christ. I think many will, will fall for that ploy uh, in that time, but what did the Lord tell the saints dwelling in the land to do when this prophesied time arrives? Well, let's return to Matthew chapter 24 and Christ's Olivet Discourse to find the answer. Here it is in chapter 24, beginning with verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Now, we know that the Greek ruler called Antiochus IV, who called himself Epiphanes, which means the illustrious one or God manifest, did that very thing when he desecrated the temple in Jerusalem some 200 years prior to Christ's Olivet Discourse. So we know that Satan was at work way back then. In fact, Satan's adversarial battle against God actually began in the garden. But we're told that Antioch IV set up an altar to Zeus over the altar of burnt offerings, and he sacrificed a pig on that altar. Historians also relate how he slaughtered a great number of the Jews and sold others into slavery. In fact, he required the Jews to sacrifice to pagan gods. However, Antiochus IV did not enter into a covenant with Israel for seven years, and Antiochus IV came prior to Christ's Olivet Discourse. So he's not speaking of that here in Matthew 24, Christ isn't. Then there are those that believe that Christ was speaking about the events leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 at the hands of Titus. But was that event a fulfillment of Christ's words in his Olivet Discourse? Keep in mind that his disciples asked him when the end of the age would come. And Christ's answer in his own Olivet Discourse goes much further than those two events we just mentioned, as we're going to be seeing as we continue our lesson here. Let's return to where we left off in Matthew chapter 24 with verses 15 and 16 once again. Here we read, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let's pick it up with verse 17. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now you probably noticed that in that very first passage you read it said let them which be in judea flee to the mountains uh, why were only those dwelling in judea told to take cover in a manner of speaking flee and go into hiding and no one else told to do the same thing why just those who were in judea well we you can see the mount of olives there uh just standing just above jerusalem uh, to the just to the right and just barely above the city of Jerusalem. And uh, so the Mount of Olives was in Judea. Christ was betrayed in Judea. Christ was crucified in Judea. Jerusalem is in Judea. Christ ascended into heaven from the Mount of Olives. And when he returns, guess where he's going to return? He's going to return to the very same place, the Mount of Olives, at Mount of Olives rather, and where? in Judea. Furthermore, Judea is the focal point of the land that God gave to Abraham's seed in the territory in which Satan had already established his own foothold after God departed the earth and located his throne room in the third heaven upon Lucifer's rebellion. Um, Bethel is in Judea, and Bethel is where Jacob had his dream. And for those of you who recall that dream and the story of Jacob's ladder in scripture, uh, Jacob laid his head on a rock for a pillow. I don't know how that took place, but that's what the Bible says. And after awakening, Jacob had these uh, astounding words to say in Genesis chapter 28, verse 17. And Jacob was afraid. And he said, how dreadful, incredibly awesome is this place. 
This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Wow. That's an interesting statement to make as he saw the angels ascending and descending back to the earth. This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Where was Jacob? He was in Judea. Now, with the departure of God's throne room to the third heaven upon Lucifer's rebellion, we can see how Satan supposed that he was now holding the title deed to planet Earth. And now God had made his plan to establish his future throne room right there in that territory of Judea. You see why a major focal point of the adversary's battle with God is over that territory that God had given to Abram and to Abram's seed. Satan has a special interest in keeping the Jewish people out of that land. Naturally, when Satan is cast out of the stellar heavens, he's going to go after the woman, Israel, with a vengeance. In fact, anyone who is of Jewish heritage. Um, the battle with anyone of Jewish heritage began long, long ago, and it doesn't matter whether they're believing Jews or not. Satan has staked his own claim to that territory as he had his own forces in place there when Abram was told to walk the length and the breadth of the land. He said, the Canaanite is already in the land. And, and Satan wants no Jewish person in that land. So we can see that without God's intervention, the people of Israel would have never been able to enter that land in the first place due to those of Satan's bidding, fighting to keep them out all along the way. A battle that continues in our day and will continue until the Prince of Peace returns to the earth. So notice Christ's words in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now reason it through. Just as the Jewish believers were in hiding from the Jewish unbelievers in the days of Paul's unbelief, hiding to avoid persecution and death, Christ was telling the believers during the final three and a half years of the tribulation period to go into hiding, flee to the mountains where God would feed them for those final three and a half years. And just as Saul of Tarsus was feverishly trying to find those believers in order to persecute them, even to the point of death, the Antichrist will be doing the very same thing when it comes to the saints of Judea in a final three and a half years leading up to the last day and the return of the Prince of the Peace. Uh, the Prince of Peace. Now, if the Antichrist wants to locate those believers who are in hiding in the mountains in order to do away with them, what better tactic than to try to convince them to come out in the open by relaying that the true Christ is now upon the scene? Move ahead to Matthew chapter 24, verses 23 and 26. Then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. False Christs and false prophets, at whose behest, we might ask? The Antichrist, of course, as he's indwelt by Satan. I like those words, if it were possible, because I don't believe it will be. Keep reading, verses 25, 26. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore... If they shall say unto you, Behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. How will they know not to believe the lies of Satan, the Satan indwelt dwelt Antichrist, who's trying to lure them out into the open? Christ is going to tell them in his Olivet Discourse the signs of it, the sign of his coming. But first, let's return to that Olivet, Olivet Discourse where Christ is describing the events at the entrance of that final three and a half years of the tribulation period, beginning with verse six, keeping in mind, of course, that the wrath of Satan, as will be exercised uh, by way of the Antichrist in, in the uh, last days, the last part of that tribulation period, is not the wrath of God. The wrath of God doesn't come until Christ returns and displays that wrath. Up until that time, he simply allows the Antichrist to do what he's doing. Uh, and that's, the, of course, by the way of the free will of man. But look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 through 8. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. The end of what again? Well, the end of the age, the end of the last days, culminating in the last day and the return of Jesus Christ in rescue and in judgment. For nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. 
There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in different places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, that's an interesting statement. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. A, uh, a woman, for instance, who's given birth can relate to the statement we just read about the beginning of sorrows when it comes to the onset of labor. Can the mothers among us not agree? Um, she starts feeling those little pains and she says, oh, I, th I think it's getting time. Uh, but verse 21 is a lot more than the beginning of sorrows as the final three and a half years wind to a close. The other things we'll be seeing during the first three and a half years are simply things that are the beginning. Uh, but there's a lot more to the beginning of sorrows that we need to look at when it comes to the final three and a half years. Verses 21 and 22 in Matthew chapter 24 go on to say, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Isn't that a wonderful verse? He's not going to let that go on forever. And he's, in fact, he's going to shorten that time period. In our birth analogy, this is not just labor contractions at this point. It's hard labor for believers at this point. First comes the easier contraction, the beginning of sorrows. Then comes the very difficult time of the labor process, the panting and the puffing when the mothers and fathers are long, longing for it to be over. But what comes next? After the beginning stages of the labor and after the difficult stages of the labor, what comes next? How about the delivery? <laughs> or in our context, the deliverance of the saints from the persecution they will be suffering at the hands of the Antichrist and his followers. The beginning of sorrows through things that the Antichrist is doing at the beginning of that three and a half years and severe labor pains when it comes to the persecution being employed against believers by the Antichrist and those doing his bidding and dwelt by Satan, of course, during the final three and a half years. So let's jump ahead to verses 29 and 30. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory christ's wrath is not displayed until he returns folks but something takes place before that wrath is displayed and that's his rescue of his people his saints um, so what about god's people Will the returning Christ rescue them from the Antichrist persecution against them? Well, let's keep reading about the returning Lord of glory in verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds uh, from one end of heaven to the other. Did Paul not tell us that we also are God's elect? The rapture? You decide. What did Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52? Behold, I ship mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not everybody's going to be, be, be killed during that tribulation period, but we all, shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at when the last trump, where the trumpet shall sound. What did, did Christ say in Matthew 24? A great sound of a trumpet. The trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be changed. What happens at that great sound, according to Christ in Matthew 24? The angel shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, as Christ himself is going to rescue the saints of that period of time. Will there be saints that have, that have been killed for their testimony in that time, for their firm stand for the faith in that time? Yes, there will. Uh, it'll be a judgment seat of Christ. As, uh, it'll be a, a greater resurrection for them in, in regard to the judgment seat of Christ. They'll be rewarded greatly for what they went through and giving themselves up for uh, the purpose of, of Christ. So we see there that God's people will be rescued uh, from the Antichrist who are alive and remain at that time. Uh, they'll be rescued from the Antichrist persecution. So let's keep reading about the returning Lord's glory in verse 31. Well, there it is. I just read it to you. Uh, so we are God's elect. I think that's a, re a, a, a uh, reference to the rapture as we see the great sound of a trumpet in both things. Now, when you put everything together, one household of faith, one church of God, a second, not a third or a secret, but a second coming of Christ 
taught by Paul and all the writers who spoke about that coming and that appearing using both words interchangeably. Um, when we know that, when we know that no one will be righteous so that they can take part in that resurrection of the just, those who had died previously uh, to Christ's return for him to bring back, uh, no one will be a part of that resurrection of the just without being judicially just from heaven's uh, court of righteousness, court of justice. And in order to be as righteous as, re as that righteousness would be required to dwell with God and be an actual part of his family, you have to belong to Christ. You have to be joined to Christ. No one who has not been joined to Christ and become a part of his body, um, being joined to him, a member of the body of Christ will be righteous to be resurrected in the resurrection of the just or the righteous. So when you put all these things together and you see that there's only one more coming of Christ, his second coming, not a third, not a secret, won't be anything secret about it. Um, it's going to be a great sound of a trumpet. And, and then the angel shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of the heaven to the other. Now, if you if you have adopted the two different church idea, a kingdom church, a body of Christ church, you would look at Matthew. This is why they do not want you to go back to Christ's words. They say, no, he he didn't come but for Israel. So we don't go to anything he said as being true for us. Uh, there is a whole lot that he said that's true for us. We just know we're not under that law. We're, we've never been under the law of Moses and we never will be under the law of Moses. And the, no one will be again because the law of Moses was nailed to the cross of Christ. Uh, Christ fulfilled it in mankind's place. And so now he's only sim he's simply asking people to do nothing but believe him, believe what he accomplished at Calvary where our sins are concerned. And that's when we are joined to the person of the son and we are joined to Christ. And that's when we have Christ's righteousness attributed to our account. But notice the wording once again from Christ and from Paul. He will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds. First Corinthians, Paul says, I'll show you a secret. We're not going to die. We shall all be changed in a moment, the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So this is, a, this is an amazing thing here uh, that we see when we accept that we, we take the Bible literally. We take the grammar in the Bible literally. Uh, are there things that we would prefer be said maybe a different way? I'm sure there are a lot of people that would say that, but the people that are so adamantly opposed to the reality of resurrection are the people that hold true and firm to the inerrancy, total inerrancy, actually to the point of being um, inspired themselves, inspired translators, uh, that every single word in the King James Bible, 1611 edition, is true. Uh, well, we could see that uh, if they're going to say that, then they've got to believe that. And if they believe that, they'll look at the grammar and look at the as a word of specificity. They'll look at uh, the single coming. Uh, they'll look at the second coming instead of, a, instead of inventing a secret coming. Uh, but you can see how inventing that secret coming um, takes anyone who believes today, any professing believer, uh, uh, in their minds to a place of safety. We don't have to worry about that because we won't be here, they say. If we won't be here, then Paul wouldn't have even had to speak on it, or he could have said so. We won't be here, so don't worry about this. Uh, he told them he had already taught them about these things, and that that day would not catch them as a thief in the night. And he didn't say it won't catch you as a thief in the night because you won't be here. They will know about it. Now, will they know the day and the time and the hour when he's coming? No. In fact, he just said, unless he cut the, that time short, do we know when that is? No, we have no idea. So we don't know when he'll come, but we know that he gave the saints in Thessalonica, Paul did, some things to look at uh, that would have to happen before Christ's second coming. So immediately after the tribulation that's coming, tribulation period of time, and Paul said, we, we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Not a little. We know the We know of all the saints that have given their lives the the um, the folks that became martyrs for the cause of Christ throughout history. And uh, we know the, about Paul and what he went through. And Paul was willing to go through it for Christ's sake. Uh, because of what Christ did for Paul, which would last throughout eternity, Paul was willing to go through the second of his uh, disappearing from the body that he was in. So 
the sign of the Son of Man appearing in heaven is going to give them cause to know for certain that it's Christ that's coming back. And they're going to see the Son of Man coming in clouds, uh, clouds of heaven with power and great glory when that day arrives. So um, Paul's statement about a mystery is true. Um, boy, I, <laughs> I like that statement. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58. I might have that. There it is. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So interesting things here in our studies, things that uh, you might not have pondered in your earlier days and uh, the movement, so so-called movement of right division. It is a movement uh, of right division, but it's not correct division when we take the Bible literally, and especially when we assume that the King James translation was actually inspired. The translators were inspired, which they made no claim to be at all. In fact, if you take the King James 1611 and blow it up enough times to read the entrance to the King James 1611, where the translators spoke about themselves, they never claimed inspiration as did the original writers of the autographs. They never claimed inspiration uh, the King James translator said they did the best they could with what they had. They never intended to make a bad translation better. They just did the best they could with what they had. So, and one other thing I want to quickly say uh, before we before we uh, close this lesson out is some people have a problem with saying the word Jesus or saying the word Christ. They say that's not God's name. Uh, in fact, there's a movement uh, that's been in place for some time, uh, churches, I, I guess, teaching this, that say, do not say Jesus because you're using a different name. And they claim that um, Constantine in AD 313 changed the written word of God. He changed it and corrupted it. So now we have the written word with the name Jesus and Christ in it, which are not god's name jesus was never god's name they say and christ was not the son of god's name um so you know what do we say to that well if i ask you to say a word over and over and over in your mind dog say dog over and over dog 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 it's just letters it's just sound coming from your voice sound but what gives meaning to the sound well, sound is for a purpose, and the sound is to take your minds to what's behind the sound. The sound is to turn your minds toward what those sounds are speaking of, the essence, the character, the meaning of what the sound is making. And so to say that we can't say the word uh, God because it's not God, it's, it's uh, well, they, they go on to say it's um, Yeshua and his son. Uh, and they even say that, Ashua. Well, you, could we would we complain that that was never in the Bible? No, we couldn't complain that was never in the Bible, but it's not the same in every language. That was the same in Hebrew, but it's not the same in every language. And I was given a nickname, for instance, when I was young and in Ohio for a summer. They didn't call me Curly. Well, that was another nickname I was given by those folks. And they never called me Curly. They well, The ones that didn't call me Curly called me Corky. So I was corky. It was an affectation for me. It was speaking of me, not of someone else. When they said corky, they had me in mind. When they said curly, they had me in mind. Uh, the word God actually comes from the German Gott, which means the all supreme one. So yes, we could say God. Uh, and if it depends on you know what you're calling him, depends on the language and how that language has changed and what designation has been given the meaning behind which is the person behind the name. When, when Moses went to rescue the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, their captivity, he asked God the Father, and we're told to call him Abba, Father. He asked God the Father, what shall I say, who shall I say sent me when they ask me your name? Who shall I sent me? And he didn't say, uh, call me Yeshua. He said, tell them I am sent you. And he was just asked to, to reveal his name. Tell them, I am sent you. Uh, I am that I am first. Uh, uh, the word, that, that statement meaning, 
eternal, the God who always was, is now, and always forever will be. That's I am. I am that I am. But that's what he told them to say when they asked his name. He didn't say, well, tell him Yeshua sent me. Uh, no, or sent you. He said, tell them I am sent you. Uh, so um, we also see that God had compound names. God was never uh, the supreme one, uh, the ultimate supreme one. God was never his name. Uh, God is who he is. God is the essence of who he is, the supreme one, which is what the word got in German means. So people would have a problem saying it's all a false religion. Christianity is a totally false religion. Don't give heed to it because, uh, because even though the same manuscripts were in existence 200 years before uh, Constantine and are still in existence today, they say the very same things. So Constantine did not change a name, but there's a reason behind the, that teaching that you cannot use the name Jesus and don't ever use the name God. You have to use his proper name. Uh, there's a reason behind that teaching, and there's a theological system behind that teaching, which needs to be investigated by the people who are following that teaching. And I've heard from a very good friend who's following it right now, but uh, thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And by the way, that same person who says you can't use the word Jesus, that's never been the name of the Son of God or the Son of Jehovah, uh, would take a look at that word Jesus and they say that last two letters, aren't they? Are they not U.S.? Are they not the word U.S.? Do they end with U.S.? The letters us? Uh, what is Zeus, the false god Zeus? What's his name end in? Z-E-U-S. So they say, say Jesus. And what's it sound like when it's pronounced correctly? Hey, Zeus. Hey, Zeus. So therefore, what a conspiracy to think that Constantine changed scripture, which we know didn't happen because we have the scripture before uh, Constantine and after Constantine, and it's the same. Uh, nothing's been changed. He didn't change scripture. He added pagan holidays to the Catholic or Catholic, Catholic, Catholic faith system in that day so as to make everybody a follower of the Catholic faith system, uh, the system in place in his day. He just brought those pagan holidays across, added them to uh, the religious system so those pagans wouldn't have near as much uh, hesitancy to join the Catholic Church, and he could make everybody uh, a Christian as they call themselves today. So, um, you know, I, I don't ascribe to any of that at all. I know that when people ad adopt these different theories, it's difficult, very difficult uh, to get them away from them, but that's okay. I have no problem with anybody saying Jesus or God <laughs> or God the Father or Abba Father. <laughs> so, um, whatever you want to say, as long as that, that those words are taking your mind to the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's fine. Uh, so I want to close out this uh, this evening's lesson the way we closed out our previous Q&A lesson with Paul's words in Ephesians 5.16 and in Colossians 4.5. You recall them, I think, quite well, where Paul tells us we should be redeeming the time because the days are evil. Boy, is that not true as we look at, at this country? Uh, founded uh, on the basis of a God, the God, uh, redeeming the time because the days are evil. We're moving so fast away from God and even faster uh, against the visible manifestation of the invisible God, and that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom toward them that are without, those who are not believers yet, redeeming the time. How can you walk in wisdom toward them who are unsaved or, or have not accepted the reality of reconciliation? I should put it this way. They've already been saved from their sins. They've just not been justified unto eternal life. How can we walk in wisdom toward those folks? By redeeming the time and conducting our ambassadorship, which according to Paul, is that conducting or furthering that message, that word of reconciliation. So that'll be it for tonight's lesson. Uh, thank you all for joining us.